All right. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, our contact information is on this slide if you want to save it for later and if you want to follow up with any specific questions for either of us. Um, oh, I hit next, but Jen, you you're in control. <laughs> I yeah, forgot. There we go. <laughs> um, so thank you so much again for joining us. Um, tonight we are talking about coastal ecology of Nantucket. Of course, this is a very broad topic. We're going to paint a broad brush in some ways about the ecology of our island and the coastal ecological habitats that make up the island, some of the processes that form these habitats, and look at some climate change adaptations, nature-based solutions, that use these processes and formations, um, you know, to kind of help with our coastal resiliency. Um, we maybe dive a little bit deeper into certain habitat types than others, but we really hope that this gives you a taste for the knowledge we do have and kind of how we're moving forward, the big we of Nantucket, how we're moving forward with um, some of these climate adaptation uh, pieces. And I do wanna, you know, give a shout out to both the Conservation Foundation and the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. Um, not just because we work there, but for our um, our board and our organizations that are really supportive of um, us doing this collaborative work. Um, and then in the corner on the left-hand side, there is this flow code that you can scan that will bring you to the Nantucket Climate Change Summit um, website, which has the recordings um, of our previous talks and lots of different information on climate change impacts. Um, and Jen and I will be adding to that as, um, as it goes. So if you kind of keep an eye on that website, that's where we kind of um, coalesce and put a lot of things together, curate that um, about climate change impacts on the island. Next. Um, so as I said, we're gonna be talking about coastal habitats, um, the process and processes that form these habitats and some of the adaptations um, as we lead into like nature-based solutions for these areas. And the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Coastal Zone Management um, defines a lot of these habitats as so coastal habitat specifically include dunes, maritime forests, salt marshes, salt ponds, beaches, rocky shores, mud flats, and seagrass beds. Um, and these habitats aren't just found like at the water's edge. So it's not just beach and coast. And when we think of coastal habitats, it's the habitats into the water, into the tidal zone, and then up into the uplands um, that kind of fringe that area. And these yellow highlighted habitats in the in the text here are the ones that we're going to be talking more about tonight. So next. Um, and our first step in this process, talking about sand driven coastal habitats. And then I think if anyone's on Nantucket right now or spends any time on Nantucket, you'd say, oh, sand driven habitats, isn't that the whole island? So sand is, of course, an important component to all aspects of the island, but we want to think about the specific habitats that are driven by these sand and the processes that form them. It's not all beach people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sand-based coastal areas, as Sarah was saying, you know, we were using the term sand driven. These are areas that are very dynamic, subject to extreme changes and really created by the ways that sand moves around. Sand is something that, you know, can be picked up and moved, can be eroded, can be moved in the water, can be blown through wind. Uh, and so we have a lot of these coastal areas that are supposed to change, are supposed to be dynamic and do shift. And here's some examples of you know, the kinds of things that we actually find here on Nantucket, our big broad beaches, our dunes and our large dune fields, our barrier beaches and our small islands. Uh, and barrier spits, like what we see forming out in this lower hand picture that's Eel Point um, on the western end of the island, you know, sit, barrier spits of sand that start to accumulate out in, into the water. So we are in the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantic Ocean is what we like to call a depositional coastline as opposed to an erosive coastline. And that sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but are the Pacific Ocean is if you've ever been out um, to the to the Pacific farther north into uh, um, sorry <laughs> losing my words for a minute up into Oregon and the rocky shorelines those are fairly solid stable shorelines that are slowly changing over time you don't see a lot of very dramatic change winter to winter 
when you come over to the Atlantic Ocean, we have what's called a depositional coastline because our sediments move and shift and change from month to month, from winter to winter. Uh, they're the kinds of sediments, the material that make up our shoreline can really move. We are a wave dominated area. We have a wide continental shelf and just a lot of sediment within our water. And we are sediment, not rock. And we get rapid erosion and change. Uh, and I like this diagram here because it shows just a lot of examples of what pieces of our shoreline can look like because of how sand, and it's predominantly sand, can move. We get sand spits that close in bays. We get lagoons that form because we have barrier islands of sand out in front of them. Um, we get inlets into areas that are small areas surrounded by that moving sand. We get broad beaches. We get solid islands that get connected by sand to a mainland. We just get a lot of variable coastline. And is this going to, oh, yes, I think this is working. <laughs> I love this example. This is Nantucket through Google Earth aerial photos from early 90s to 2022. And we're looking at Eel Point and we're looking at Smith Point here. And I know it's a little grainy because some of these photos um, aren't as high quality in the past as we want them to. But as you can watch it, you can just see over time how dynamic this shoreline is. I mean, particularly Eel Point, um, as soon as the connection with um, Esther's Island closed, Eel Point almost doubled in size between the time of this, this video recording here as it accumulated sediments that were eroding and moving around from other areas of the island. Uh, and you can also see under the water uh, that amount of sediment that's shifting and moving nonstop. So we just have a very, that word dynamic, we have a coastline that's constantly changing. And the predominant process, how this is working, is the, is this term here that we're going to explore, explore called longshore or littoral drift. And it's the movement of sand um, in the water up and down our shorelines. And I like this diagram because it's very simple. You have your prevailing wind direction. And then you can go down, think about going down to the south shore and standing there and watching the waves come in and break at an angle and pull back and break at an angle up to the beach and pull back. And every time they do that, they're dropping sand and they're taking sand. And then sand is moving in the water along the shoreline. So that's that long shore drift, that movement of sand down our beaches. So um, some data here that was actually put together by the um, Center for Coastal Studies, studying our area and how sediment moves. On average, a wave hits our shore every, 60, every six seconds. So 600 wave hits an hour, 14,000 a day, 5.3 million wave hits on an area of shoreline in a year on average. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of movement, a lot of force onto a beach. So yearly average longshore sediment transport, how much sediment is moving when we think about waves hitting like this? Well, these are kind of the accumulations here. So within a year, it's approximately 400,000 cubic yards. And we can take this down to think how many dump trucks of sand a day. That's a good a good measurement to think of. It's about 100 to 150 dump trucks of sand are moving up and down on our beaches and through that longshore drift every day. So that's one dump truck every 10 to 15 minutes. That's a lot of sediment. Um, there's times a year that that varies that Sarah will talk about in a minute. But just thinking about yearly, those averages helps lead us to think about how dynamic and changing our shoreline is. And then I would be remiss to not talk about one of the really unique longshore drift actions, pieces of geology that we have here on Nantucket. And that's our cuspate spits, the points of CO2 um, within our harbor. And this structure, this geologic structure of sediment on a shoreline exists in very few places in the world. And it takes a really particular set of circumstances for that to exist. And you need to have dominant waves that are hitting a shoreline from one direction. So on Nantucket, our um, wind kind of tends to come up from the southwest and hitting into the bends of Kotu and onto the points and moving sand out to those points. But the reason we get the points staying in place is that we also have our tides moving in and out. So we have our waves coming in at one angle, and then we have our micro tides, our small tidal ranges 
competing in a different direction from that wind direction. And that forms those points and helps them stay in place for a fairly long term, um, you know, a long term amount of time for a sand based beach. There's a picture here up off the coast of Russia, which is one of the only others, only one other place besides here in the world that they've actually documented through aerial photos, a cuspate spit formation like this. So like I said, it's extremely unique and extremely tied to our wind and wave patterns along our shoreline. And then just so you can kind of imagine this in another diagram, prevailing winds coming in, kind of hitting that shore. If you imagine this is Kotu up from the Southwest, moving sediment down um, along this spit. So it's slowly moving it out onto this spit down here. But the reason it doesn't just curve and connect back to the shoreline is because you have your tides coming and pushing against the backside of the spit. So it maintains that spit in place. Um, and so that is that process for why we have these unique cuspate spits on the island. Um, great. Sorry. <laughs> I was now like, oh, over sure. to Sarah moving into talking I know, about and I like had three. my like cheat sheet because I was like oh I wanted to remember what I was gonna say and then I I got my cheat sheet out of order so I'm sorry <laughs> um so there's basically you know when we aside from our cuspate spits when we're thinking of it once again these generalized beaches like when we're looking at the processes we, you know, if you've gone to any of our talks before, Jen and I love these diagrams because they generalize it so we can really visualize the different actions and places that we're talking about. So this is a, you know, kind of a generalized beach, but you can picture any of the South, South Shore beaches are really kind of fold into this. Then there's three basic aspects of a beach. There's the, when I say, when I say beach, this is the dune system. There's the subtitle beach, which is the part obviously that's under the water um, and or under the water at different times, depending on what the tide is. Um, there is the the beach or the open beach. Um, that is where, um, you know, there is a lot of dynamic action. So there's fewer things that can grow here. There's different things that can use this area, but it's most basically the open sand. Um, I like this diagram because it has the, the rack line. Um, that's going to be important. Oops, that's going to be important for a sec when we talk about how these um, dunes form. And then there's the back dune, which is more the vegetated dune, basically. Um, and you know, it's kind of you know we can picture any beach and picture this habitat. Um, and it's like thinking about why would we need to kind of uh, drill down to those three different types. But I think as we think about those three different areas, those have really three different big actions of how they're formed and how they interact with the wind and the water. Um, the processes on top really help show, you know, where the action is. So we were talking about, you know, Jen had mentioned the littoral drift, which is that wind and wave action. We talk about the marine winds coming in offshore and then the inland winds coming from the land. And they have, you know, they're different, um, they're not the same. They're not totally, you know, um, competing at any given time at this, you know, the same speed and direction, but they help form that shifting dune face. So if you look at that in the back dune, there's that shifting dune. There's that, um, we're going to talk about the shape of the dune in the next slide, but really it's what shapes that, um, that wave shape. So there's the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so when we look at the, even within the dune system, the subcategories, the embryonic dune or the fore dune um, that's closest to the beach um, has that, that beginning stages of the vegetation. And so that's, you know, kind of becoming more stable. Sometimes that drift or that rack line in the, um, on the beach edge really helps stabilize some of that sand and helps that vegetation become, come in place. And so understanding a little bit about these processes and how these dunes are formed and how they stabilize is helping us think about as we see sea level rise, for example, increased storms and storm surge, um, understands a little bit more about how the sand moves and why and when, if you wanna hit next. And so um, I did wanna to touch on this summer beach versus winter beach, because when we talk about the processes that shape our dune systems, our beach and coastal um, areas, there's different scales um, of, 
of impact, if you will. So we know that there's tides on a daily cycle that affect the beach and you know where the water is. There are the seasonal changes like this summer and winter beach. And I'm gonna talk about that process in a minute. Um, and then there's the annual cycles. Um, there's decadal cycles of as we see with climate um, impacts. And so all these different scales of change and impact really ch change what the beach and what that dune system looks like. And so a summer beach, let's say um, for visualization purposes, I'm gonna think of Maya Comet Beach, some, an area where I go and we might walk the dog. In the summer, we're um, even on the South shore, it's more of a uh, gentle, there's like a Southwest wind. It's a very broad open beach. It backs up to a um, the berm system uh, or say system, there's the berm and then the dune crest and the back dune where the vegetated dune is. Um, and if you're walking from, let's say, the parking area and you're going over that dune system, you know, there's a gentle walk down to the beach. If you go to that same beach um, in the wintertime, um, oftentimes, or in a winter beach situation, that berm has been eroded and it is a seasonal erosion. So there's a, you know, as Jen was saying with the littoral drift and talking about even the cuspate spits, the combination of the tide and winds are really shaping these areas. These are dynamic systems and the sediment is moving around. And in the winter time, our prevailing winds are Northwest. Um, and when we have storms, we have these Nor'east storms and they, and then with the temperature of the water and we have more storms in the winter, that is, you know, having a higher wave action onto the beach and has a different impact for the sand. So it's eroding that berm away, but where is that sediment going? So oftentimes there's, and this is, I'm, this is a generalization for what happens, but that berm is eroded away in the winter beach, but it's deposited offshore as a, like a sandbar. And then in the summer beach, it builds back up again as that sand is redeposited from the sandbar back onto the beach. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, historically, this is what we find when we people say a summer beach versus a winter beach, where there's that berm erosion and then it's being deposited again in the summertime. Where we see some vulnerability is in the winter, during a winter beach when that berm is gone and then there's additional storms and maybe additional um, impacts that at a, you know, higher intensity than maybe is traditional or, it, you know, under the, like, um, the long-term average that there might be additional erosion. Um, so that's, you know, there's the um, way we measure this is by beach profiling and we can measure how much sand is or what the, the shape and that um, the shape of the beach to see how much is gone in a seasonal cycle and how much is gone in an annual cycle and where is their long-term erosion versus just that seasonal erosion. You want to go to the next? And so when we look at the dune ecology, um, we think about how the dunes are formed. And as we said, they're formed with the combination of the winds blowing landward um, from the dry part of the beach. And how the dunes form, you know, a lot of it and or the exact shape of the dunes isn't only like how much wind there is and how dynamic the ocean is at that part. Are you on like on a Nantucket? Are you on the South Shore? Are you on the North Shore? It's also what's the sediment? How big are those sand grains? Um, for how much can be needs or how much wind needs to transport them. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot going into the shapes of these dunes and these dune systems. So there is some generalizations we can make, but every system is quite unique. Um, and these well-developed dune systems typically have this sinusoidal or wave-like shape that we're seeing in this diagram, where you go from the ocean to the beach to the fore dune, and then you get to this primary dune ridge where there's really, that's where the vegetation starts. Um, that is what stabilizes these dunes. Um, and then depending on how much land you, how much sand space you have, I will say, you can have more waves in these interdune swales um, and then even like a secondary dune ridge. Um, it depends how much, once again, space you have. Um, and then the actual dune shape is once again caused by climate variability, the relative sea level, um, how dynamic that system is in terms of what like the wave action, how shallow it is, um, the sediment supply, so how much sand is available to be transported around, um, and the grain size, 
Um, and then the vegetation as well. And there's so many other coastal dynamics, once again, at multiple scales that affect these systems. Next, please. And so in terms of dune stabilization as a plant ecologist, I'm like, let's talk about the plants because that really, you know, yes, sand is important but as these sand driven habitats. But what is what stabilizes these, ha these habitats? And so in many of these areas in this four dune system, um, the first thing we have these pioneer species is, of course, dune grass. And beach grass is really kind of an amazing species because it's not only these little pieces that you're seeing on the above ground when you're seeing um, a beach gra beach grass in the sand, but these the the beach grass stabilizes the sand by sending runners. So what runner is is basically a root system or a shoot that spreads laterally along the sand and then puts in roots as well as above ground material. And it basically forms a living web that's kind of holding in place the sand. Um, and so this is a really amazing plant. These pioneer species are always amazing because they grow fast. Um, they have an e a specific ecosystem function, but they also are tolerant in one of the most dynamic and really hard to be places as driven windy habitat um, where there's salt spray and everything. Um, if you want to hit next, it's one of my favorite photos. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can hit next. Uh, okay. you don't see it? Nope, it's for well, I don't see it. I don't know if anyone else sees it. Hit next take. Do you see it? Oh, there you go. It's, I saw a picture of Harvey. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, it just popped up. So, this is a picture of Harvey Young, who was on our one of our coastal ecology classes a few years ago. And this was some of the erosion, um, out in Madiket, which we're going to see, um, on Friday's field trip. And um, what I love is this is a piece of um, beach grass that had been exposed from the erosion. And so what he's holding out is this runner. So this piece of lateral piece of growth that goes out and you can see the roots going down and the very small shoots coming up. So if you were only to see the growth of the beach grass, you'd only see maybe a foot. It looks like six inches to a foot, but you see multiple feet going down. And so this is really this kind of woven net of living material that stabilizes um, the sand in many areas. <clears throat> Excuse me, next please. And you know, this looks like kind of a silly picture, but this is, can be, this is actually from Kotu, but it honestly could be anywhere on Nantucket. As you have more beach grass um, and other pioneer species stabilizing the sand, then you have more organic material, which attracts, you know, or can trap more um, seeds. So we have, um, you know, some uh, solid um, seaside goldenrod, we have beach pea, we, you know, poison ivy does this, we have beach plums and bayberries um, that will grow in these areas, trap more seeds, more sediment, and then themselves provide organic material to further stabilize the dune systems. And then even pieces of driftwood like this, which are, you know, now kind of just organic non-living material can serve that same purpose. So it's interesting to think about structures that hold sand in place that help create a natural system to stabilize the soil. Just like put a pin in that as we think about nature-based solutions. <laughs> Next. And then I wanted to show this picture of a well-known area that now that we talked a little bit about dune stabilization and sinusoidal dune, you know, fore dune and back dune and the swales, um, this is a part of Nantucket that is, you know, kind of living this. So this is um, the beach from S Steps Beach. Like this is from the steps at Steps Beach. And while you can't see the beach in this spot, you can see the peak of the four dune. Um, there's a lot of beach grass. There's some Rosa rugosa, the salt spray rose. Um, both species have really, you know, extensive root systems that will kind of hold into the sand. Then there's a swale, so like the back dune that goes low. Um, in this case, there's a little shack there, um, which seems pretty stable. Um, and you can think about it also, you're not a best place to build, build a structure, but that structure is pretty well protected by that fore dune there. Um, and so, you know, and then the back, as you go further up towards the steps, there's more different, more vegetation, but also a higher diversity as you get more, um, uh, organic material building up and that kind of thing. So, you know, there's a low diversity of species that can grow that fore dune and then you get higher diversity, excuse me, as you go back. 
And then I wanted to go into, it seems like a big jump to go from Stubbs Beach to Brant Point. Um, but I think it's really nice to think of, or I want to show this as a historical example of using some of the same processes to protect vital infrastructure. So this is where I definitely need my cheat sheet because I am not a historian and I can't remember dates as well. Um, so I loved learning about Brant Point Lighthouse um, as an ecologist um, and also as a, you know, somebody living on Nantucket. So Brant Point Lighthouse was originally built in 1746. It was a vital piece of infra infrastructure. It warned against the very shallow shoals for boats coming into the harbor. Um, it was an area of a lot of shifting sand. So as you can see from this picture, this picture um, is from early 1900s. I think it was from 1901. But at this time, Brant Point was out into the water. So there was like the boardwalk leading to Brant Point was um, over water. And while it was built in 1746, it was it had to be rebuilt many times. There was fire, it was, there were storms, it was blown down. Um, and so it was, you know, not only was it a vital piece of infrastructure, but it was vul very vulnerable itself. Um, and so one of the last times it was um, rebuilt in 1901 is when it was decided that there needed to be some assistance to the um, uh, lighthouse to help protect it. If you want to hit next. Um, you can start to see here how far off the water it was at low tide, but also there's like the little beginning of some protective structures. If you want to hit next, I think that's the best one. Yeah, so in um, 1901, when there was a rebuild of the lighthouse, there was some riprap put around so this rock infrastructure that is basically a breakwater. So not only does it help reduce the wave action and impacts of storms onto the lighthouse itself, it's slowing down all that wave action. So remember how when Jen was talking about littoral drift and how much sand and sediment movement was in that water that's going up and over and up and over. Well, if you slow that water down, all the sediment that's in that water is like like released, I guess, for lack of a better way of saying it. And so it stabilizes this area. And what was behind Brant Point Lighthouse uh, was previously salt marsh. Um, as we, as humans, build onto it, slow the water processes around it, um, there is a buildup of the vegetation and the sediment around. But it's not just all natural, right? We want to, um, you know, what else happens to this area? If you want to hit next, I think I can't remember. Oh, yeah, this was in the 1920s. Um, and then this is sort of present day. This is probably about five or six years ago now. But um, you can see where Brant Point Lighthouse is. You can see the riprap that's still around it. And yet you can see all the sand and sediment that has built up. And then you can see the vegetated dunes behind. And if you've ever been out there, um, you may remember there's Rosa Ragosa, there's Bayberry, Hoist and Ivy for sure, but there's definitely lots of uh, dune grass as well that has stabilized this area. So while maybe the sediment isn't all com completely naturally um, input, the vegetation has naturally occupied this area. If you wanna hit next. Um, so this area actually has um, undergone some beach nourishment. So beach nourishment, first I'll talk generally about beach nourishment and then tell you about Brant Point Lighthouse. So dredging and beach nourishment have been done, you know, all over the country, all over the world probably, but um, this is a, a tool that's actually been, is still really widely used in um, the Southern US where sand is dredged from offshore and then used um, to put onto onshore to add sediment. So um, we're not changing any of the uh, processes. We still have winter beach, summer beach, we still have littoral drift, but you have to have material for all that to move around, right? So adding material just moves all that sand around. Um, and so if you see that diagram on the right-hand side, um, you see that there is, do, if you put beach nourishment on the sand in that kind of like four dune. And then even the dune nourishment up in the back, we know through the processes as we see with littoral drift and with like summer beach and winter beach, that that sand is slowly going to be pulled out into the water, but it's gonna be put into that system of littoral drift. So it's not gonna, when you put that sand and you don't expect that sand to all stay at that 
height, it is, you know, becomes part of the system. Um, and if you want to hit next. So, you know, we regularly dredge our, you know, the the way into our harbor, our channel, because it's a navigable waterway. It's part of our vital infrastructure to the island, how we get goods and services, how we travel back and forth. And so the Army Corps of Engineers is in charge of this. And so with that dredge, there are dredge spoils. So the sand that is dredged out has to be put somewhere. Um, and so historically, it's actually a lot of it has been put on Brant Point. Um, this diagram on the left was from a plan in uh, 2018 that the U.S. Coast Guard put together because they were dredging around where the Coast Guard boats are. Thank you, Jen, for highlighting that. Um, and so it makes sense to put it near, you know, both for ecologically for sediment match um, and also for, you know, ease of cost and, and movement and everything. For if you're having to dredge for, you know, you know, boats good in, you know, navigable waterways to put that um, beach nourishment into um, onto a nearby area. And so Brant Point is actually the result of both a um a uh the riprap to prevent you know kind of slow down that wave action which traps sediment but then also added beach nourishment which has built up that area um of brand point forget what's next <laughs> Ooh, water we're gonna get away from sand now so we've talked we've done you know, kind of a, a deepish but overbrush view of sand-driven habitats, coastal habitats on Nantucket. And Sarah's talked a little bit about, you know, what it means when we start to try and alter where sand is going. Uh, in thinking ahead, we're going to talk about some of our coastal resilience solutions that are tied to impacts of climate change that we've talked about previously. So kind of keep all these ideas um, percolating in, in your minds as we talk. Um, but now we're going to shift kind of the, the next third of the talk tonight to water-based wetlands to, or to water-based coastal habitats. And these are wetlands. These are places that are influenced by water along our shoreline. Um, so broad definition, wetlands are areas where water covers the soil, where it's present, you know, under or near the surface of the soil for varying parts of the year, but primarily during the growing season so that it impacts the plants that are growing there. Not all plants can grow flooded or with their roots flooded with water all the time. So that water is really what drives the kinds of vegetation or the kinds of plants that you have in an area and essentially makes a wetland. Coastal wetlands are directly adjacent to the ocean, as you can imagine, and particularly out here on Nantucket, the ones that we have most commonly are our salt marshes uh, and our coastal ponds or our estuaries that are near our shorelines. And this diagram here kind of takes you through an estuary from the ocean tidal salt water. And as you move farther and farther away from the ocean, your water gets fresher and fresher because you have less of that salt influence. So you can actually have tidal freshwater wetlands, and then you get into your non-tidal wetlands. And if you imagined a bit of a beach down here, we would potentially be looking at some of our coastal ponds like Hummock Pond. This is a very pretty accurate um, model of what Hummock Pond can look like. So here are some just overview visual examples of water-based coastal habitats that we have here on Nantucket from our salt marshes at various times of year, to our coastal plain ponds, to our freshwater marshes, and even to our swamps. And people that have defined definitions of wetlands love to name different kinds of wetlands based on the vegetation that's there. So if an area is wet and it has trees, it's a swamp. Um, we have a few swamps on Nantucket. What we're going to talk about primarily today are those habitats that are right near that shoreline and things that we can think of for nature-based solutions. So we're really going to hit on salt marshes as our primary one, but also talk about some of our freshwater marshes as well. As I said, if something is a wetland, it's because it's being defined by that water. It's kind of in that term, wet land. So hydrology is the term for where is the water going and how long is it staying there in a study of how water moves through a system. And water really is what defines wetlands. And on Nantucket, we have tidal or our salty wetlands and we have our freshwater wetlands. Um, our coastal wetlands, as you can imagine, as I said, water in plants, water is stressful. If you add salt to that water, it's even more stressful. So that greatly limits the kinds of plants that can grow within our tidal wetland areas. 
Uh, tidal areas are interesting because the water is there, but it changes. We have high tides, low tides, so the amount of water <clears throat> that's in a system can change over time, and how salty it is can change over time, depending on how far inland you are. With freshwater systems, we tend to have a fairly regular water level that can change depending on drought, on rainfall, on groundwater coming up in, but it's that fresh water that's influencing the species that are there. So let's dive into salt marshes. This is a beautiful picture of the creeks close to sunset, one of our big, broad salt marshes that's in town that anyone can go down and, and have access to walk, it, walk into. The soils of a salt marsh are primarily peat, which is organic soils. It's made up of the plants that are growing in that wetland as they're slowly dying over time and accumulating. Um, that's all of the soils that are there are made up of plant material in some stage of decomposition. So it's a unique soil structure that we're finding in wetlands. And you occasionally get sand that are that are coming over these salt marshes that's brought in from that dynamic sand that's moving through our waterways. Hydrology is tidal and it's salty. So it comes in, it varies twice a day. And sometimes all of these plants that you see here are completely covered by water. And sometimes you see a lot of the soil structure when we're at really low tide. So these are really variable places for our plants to live. Um, plants need to be salt and water tolerant. And so it's extremely low diversity. So it's low number of different kinds of plants that can grow there. But it is one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, which means there's the most amount of plant material of biomass that grows within these salt is found within these salt marshes. So even though it's really restrictive, the few plants that can grow there do a really good job of growing there. <clears throat> Here is a kind of side view diagram of a salt marsh. And I love this because it really illustrates that elevation is extremely important to what's going on in our all, all salt marshes, but it's very, very small changes in elevation. So the key, if you look over on the left-hand side here, you can see dashed lines for mean low water. So at low tide, our mean high water. So you know, on average, what is the highest water that's coming in and how far is it going in up on the soil surface? And then the spring high water, are those super high tides, those neap tides that come in. And you can see as you follow this elevation gradient of the marsh, how far that water might be going in and covering the surface of the soil. So we have two areas to our marshes. We have low marsh, which is closest to your ocean or your harbor area. And those plants you can see get underwater most, most days, have water at least you know sitting on the soil surface or starting to flood those plants. We really have few species that can grow down there. It's primarily Spartina, Alternaflora, which is smooth cord grass. Behind that is the high marsh, and these are areas that get flooded probably twice a month, and you can see there's a lot more species diversity there, but it is a very, very small change in elevation from that low marsh to the high marsh. And then behind that is that transition zone to the upland that almost never gets flooded out. Now, if you've seen our lectures on climate change, you know one of the big impacts that comes to salt marsh is sea level rise. So seeing this amount of water coming back in changing over time in areas that weren't regularly flooded becoming more flooded. So changing this definition of where our low and high marsh is is one of the impacts that we see coming to salt marshes. Salt marshes in New England, as I said, they're very productive in the plants, but also in all of the different things that they support. And I love, love this, this uh, diagram because it shows the amount of species that are in all of those different areas of a salt marsh and transitioning to your upland. Um, in New England, uh, and you know, particularly for us in the Atlantic, approximately 80% of our commercially and recreationally important species that we are fishing for are in, within our harbor systems or in our, our water systems are dependent on salt marshes for some portion of their life cycle whether it's that they're feeding there, that they're going in and finding food, whether eggs are laid there, whether they're nursery grounds, some spend uh, winter time within salt marshes as a protective area. Um, but in Massachusetts and Nantucket, our scallops, our clams, bluefish, striped bass, flounder, our crab species are all reliant on having salt marshes in place for their ecology. The other really important benefit of salt marshes on island is that they are nutrient sinks. They are really great 
It's filtering out nitrogen and phosphorus runoff. The plants can take that up as water moves through a salt marsh and that reduces the nutrient inputs into a harbor, uh, which increases water quality within our harbor and decreases the risk of algae blooms. So from an ecological perspective, these are the reasons that having salt marshes are really uh, important from a functional piece. <clears throat> And then they are extremely protective of our uplands because they can absorb water with higher storms and sea level rise. So they provide a barrier to our uplands that makes us more resilient. They also capture sediment. You know, we've talked a lot about sediment moving with littoral drift and through our water systems uh, with talking about sand beaches, but salt marshes also capture sediment in storms where sediment is washed over and the grasses will grow back up through. This is really important because if there's enough sediment moving around, enough sand moving around, salt marshes can actually keep rise with the rate of sea level rise for a while. They can grow in elevation naturally on their own. That's what they've been designed to do or how they've designed themselves over time. That's essentially, you know, uh, eco or evolutionarily how salt marshes react to these dynamic systems. So having sediment in place is one of those ways that we can help salt marshes adapt naturally on their own. And interestingly enough, one of the restoration techniques that's used um, in some parts of the world, not Massachusetts yet, but some other states have permitted this, is what's called thin layer sediment deposition, where thin layers of like that dredged material that Sarah was talking about at Brant Point, Maybe instead of putting it on Brant Point, you can spread thin layers of it over salt marshes so that the salt marshes increase in elevation and the grasses um, grow through. When we come to talking about adaptation in a minute, it a lot of times it's really thinking about how you gain more elevation in your coastal areas because sea level rise is that's increasing in elevation. So how do you keep your buffers, your natural areas increasing in elevation? And this is one of those, one of those interesting ways that. We have yet to pilot in Massachusetts, but perhaps soon. Okay. Okay, so um, you know, not not to uh to steal the thunder of salt marshes, but we have our fresh water marshes and wetlands as well, um, which is basically you know the fringe around our freshwater ponds, and there's you know, the salt marshes have a particular ecological function and are really that, um, uh, you know, kind of in transition zone between the upland and our saltwater systems. And so our freshwater systems are in general supposed to be more stabilized. There's, there's a little bit less dynamic nature because they're not typically inundated by tides, tide flow. There's, of course, the annual flow of, you know, higher or some of them are more rainfall dependent. So precipitation affects the water levels. Um, there's groundwater fed um, marshes and ponds that are, of course, fluctuate with groundwater levels. Um, but basically, there's usually a higher diversity of plants, animals, and, you know, and, um, you know, birds, flora and fauna, basically, that can utilize these systems because they aren't the same harsh environments. As we talked about with salt marshes, being um, that saltwater tolerant or, uh, you know, able to withstand that saltwater is a really unique, very narrow um, niche for certain species. Um, however, our freshwater systems being non-tidal and our plant, more, many more plants are able to utilize freshwater. So there's a lot more higher diversity. Um, we know in general that higher diversity systems are very resilient. And so in theory or in general, a um, well-functioning freshwater system is more resilient to change. Um, there are also really important um, uh, areas where stormwater runoff and, you know, basically water runoff into many of our uh, freshwater systems. And so we think of all of our glacial ponds and the fringes of our ponds are really these freshwater marshes in general. So we're not going to go in too much into in depth into these areas, but just to say these are also important um, coastal habitats because many of our freshwater ponds are right on the edge of um, of our ocean systems. And I, you know, I think we're going to talk in a little bit about how these are some of the maybe not more vulnerable, but areas that are subject to change um, because they're so close to the ocean water. And we're going to talk about some of the um, impacts of sea level rise on our freshwater systems, that these are kind of indicators of where change might be. Um, we know that some of the some of these freshwater systems like 
excuse me, Hamak Pond and Samak and Sakasha are opened regularly to the ocean. They're still considered freshwater systems with a brackish influx. Um, but then there's other ponds like my comet. Um, I'm just like blanking Kapam, <laughs> you know, other ponds that are really closed systems and are very infrequently, um, if ever, inundated with salt water. Next. And then we have some other impacted um, freshwater marshes. And, you know, I'm going to give a broad brush of this um, system. And Jen, please uh, feel free to jump in at any point because this is a, um, a habitat and or rather an area that you're very familiar with. Um, for those of you who aren't recognizing these photos, these are parts of Brant Point, the marsh that's basically um, the um, kind of Brant Point Eastern Street uh, circle. It's called the Eastern Street Marsh. Um, and when we look at historical photos of this area, most of this area was actually salt marsh at one point. Much of our downtown, you know, we don't we didn't get to, into it in this lecture today, but a lot of times we talk about how the his, you know, what was Nantucket, like what parts of town were, you know, were and um and the history, the ecological and natural history of the island really shapes what we have today. And so a lot of this area was actually salt marsh. Um, now you can see with development um and the roads and basically the building structures around this area, that marsh in the very middle that you can see at a high tide event or high water event, um, there's with a standing water, um, that area is closed off now from the harbor, both you know Nantucket Harbor and the, the north and south and all around. And so while this area was connected regularly and part of a salt marsh, over time it became more of a freshwater system. Um, basically it was inundated with you know, rain, salt, um, uh, groundwater, and um, probably runoff from um, from the surrounding uh, street areas. And so we know, you know, even without sampling the water, looking at a lot of these pictures, I can tell as an ecologist, like the plants define the type of habitat. I mean, the plants are responding to the water and the sediment, but we know that there's all these freshwater plants coming in. So this was sort of functioning as a freshwater system for, I don't know, Jen, how many, like decades, if you will? I don't actually know the overall timeline. It was sometime, I believe, in the late 1800s that the road was put in that cut off yeah. the marsh from saltwater influence. Yeah, so so over time, over like decades and, and over a century, this area changed from a saltwater system to a freshwater system. And the plants, the flora, the fauna responded as such. It is only in the recent decades that there has been washover events um, from significant storm surge and combined with sea level rise that this area is now being regularly inundated with salt water again. Not on the same tide cycle level as like a functioning salt marsh, but often enough that there are some changes to um, the vegetation. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Jen, because you've been more part of this uh, <laughs> surveys of the vegetation of this area. No, it's it's getting to that point in the next slide when we go into it, that as groundwater, sea level rise and groundwater is rising up, we're getting more pulses of salt water into this marsh, which is changing the ecology. And as you can see, it's fairly full of, of water. So it's... Mm -hmm it's not necessarily a place that's going to be able to buffer a lot of Brant Point because it's already at that groundwater tidal uh, interface and it's holding as much water as it can at this point. And I think that's a really important thing, you know, when Jen was talking about salt marsh function earlier, one of the major, you know, kind of benefits is the, its ability to hold water. So after significant storm events and, and rainwater and, you know, significant storm water runoff, salt marshes in general and marshes, hold on to water and then can release it um, over time, which really helps, um, you know, not that this is the way they were designed, but like for helping for infrastructure. Areas like this, which are regularly holding water on a, in a regular basis and are, you know, kind of surrounded by this infrastructure will have a more difficult time buffering against the, um, the coming changes. If you want to hit next. Um, I really like this infographic that Jen really recently found because um, it illustrates some of the things that we have been talking about um, where freshwater, what happens to freshwater wetlands with sea level rise. So if you look first on the left, um, 
what we're looking at here in this diagram is there's the fresh water and then there's the, the fresh groundwater. There is salty groundwater, as you can kind of see that transition to the ocean. And what typically happens is the um, fresh water will float on top of the, the salt water. There's kind of like that fresh water lens on top. And so if the ocean is rising, and thank you for demonstrating, like using the cursor, Jen, because I'm using my hands and it doesn't really help on Zoom, but as the ocean is rising and there's more surge in landward, it's pushing up the groundwater. So when we think of sea level rise, it's not just the ocean is rising, it's actually pushing into the land too, and then pushing up that fresh water lens under, underneath and pushing that fresh water up. So what does it hap what happens then when that fresh water is being pushed up um because it's floating on top of that salt water? Well, we're already seeing some of those impacts. So the like what people will be seeing as impacts is flooded basements, um flooded uh you know landscaping if they're a, near a pond, um I was interested in this diagram specifically talking about damage to pipelines and sewer systems. We've seen saltwater infiltration into wells that are, um, uh, you know, wells that are dug in areas that, you know, are kind of close to that saltwater, um, gra that salty groundwater piece. Um, and then how does that impact roads and other, and other infrastructure? And so it's just um, thinking about how our, that sea level rise piece and where that ocean water is going isn't just impacting what's directly in front of the beach and the dune. It's also going to be impacting, um, it's going to you know rise all the levels of the ponds in that way if that are against that salt water piece. And so it's also you know kind of thinking about how where does all that water want to go, basically. And we don't really have, you know, we have predictive models for the island that show where sea level rises, where erosion is happening, you know, what we can expect in the next 20, 30, 50, 100 years. We don't really have those models for groundwater yet. And a lot of it's depending on soil structure and, you know, distance from the ocean. But what we can generally expect is that a lot of the boundaries of our wetlands are going to expand. You know, the areas where our wetlands are might get bigger. Um, some areas, you know, kind of in this diagram, there's, you know, little pop-ups of water, areas that maybe were never wet in the past will suddenly start getting wet and the vegetation might change. So we're, we're going to see changes to where water is showing up on our landscape that uh, we're going to have to adapt to in the future. I think that's a great point. And you can start seeing it now too by area, thinking of areas that are sometimes wet, you know, like, oh, every once in a while after a heavy rain, the, these areas might hold water for a little bit that might happen more frequently and not necessarily because there's more rain, but because there's more groundwater um, pulsing up. Mm. Next. Mm. So we've given some broad brush discussions of different coastal habitats from sand driven to our water-based systems. And now we want to talk about nature-based solutions. Solutions to what? Solutions to impacts of climate change. Um, this diagram is great because it really goes from the traditional or the gray infrastructure, gray engineering responses to particularly sea level rises what's modeled here, but we can think about erosion as well. And from gray all the way to hybrid versions to completely natural and green. And what this is really talking about is using the natural resilience that exists in our communities and figuring out how to enhance that to increase resiliency, but also thinking about how maybe we can tie these two together in places where we really need to protect areas. So, you know, one example would be thinking about in the Coast Resilience Plan for the island, uh, through our downtown, there's a talk of building a flood barrier to protect the historic and really important infrastructure of downtown. Well, if we built a hard flood barrier, that's not all that we would build. We would build natural systems, marshes, rain gardens, places that can take and hold water in front of that, not only because it, it provides a natural buffer, but it increases the um, ecological value. It increases the beauty of the area. Uh, and research is showing that when you tie these two together, when you tie nature-based solutions to gray traditional engineering, it's more successful than that gray engineering is on its own. So we're going to next kind of explore how those different coastal communities we've talked about can help us in this adaptation phase. 
This is, I like this because it really illustrates tying the two pieces together. This is um, some example images from our coastal resilience plan that the town has. And this is looking at Pulpus Road, particularly at Folgers Marsh, which is a place where the road is quite low and the culvert under the road is undersized. Uh, and it does overwash and flood. So these were just really conceptual ideas of what are the kinds of solutions we could have for a place like that. And on the bottom, we have the very first thing, which is elevating that road out of your flood levels and increasing the size of the culvert so you get better ecological connection from one side of the road to the other. There's salt marshes on either side of the road. This solves the problem. You know, this is a, a, a gray infrastructure piece that adapts the problem and still allows the salt marsh to exist on either side. But a slightly more advanced way of thinking about it is actually designing a, a raised bridge roadway that allows ecological connection underneath, allows that salt marsh to adapt under, so you're providing resilience by raising your infrastructure, but you're also actively increasing the resilience and the, the health of your salt marsh by reconnecting it, by reconnecting that hydrology, that water flow, that creates the salt marsh. Um, so this is kind of that example of how you can think of a, a, a grayer, a more traditional response to water, or you can adapt your thinking to tie nature and infrastructure together. Sarah, you're gonna talk about dunes. Yes, so kind of um, building off you know, no pun intended, building off of what the earlier discussion about dunes, dune systems and how they form, you know, like I said before, we can learn a lot about how we want to then protect dune, enhance dunes. One of the ways we think about nature-based solutions is enhancing what we have or, you know, maybe it's a restoration repairing what we have or enhancing something that already exists um, instead of creating something completely new. And so in this um, diagram example, there's like the, the, uh, the top part is the current status in this degraded system. So maybe there was a wash over a significant storm where there's now this dot, this dune is getting regularly inundated with tide, storm surge, the continuous wave action, and then the water's running up and over. And so then you can see this um, with all this overwash, there's, you know, impact to homes, infrastructure buildings. And so the green solution or the nature-based solution would be really um, assisting this dune to become more stable. And as we learned from previous examples, stabilizing this dune is really revegetating in different ways. And so both, you know, creating something in the fore dune closer to the ocean, and then maybe this it looks like a stylized beach grass along the top of the dune. Um, and so while these natural processes, these plants can colonize an area, if we plant and if we plan um, to kind of enhance and help that happen, it helps stabilize that dune in a you know faster fashion. It doesn't prevent overwash or overflow or storm surge from happening. It just makes sure that dune is a little bit more stable. And so like, once again, in this diagram, the overwash is still happening, but to a lesser extent. And so that, you know, the, the swale in the middle, whether that's an artificial or natural construction, it's able to hold water now. Um, and less water that, you know, kind of went over. And so then there is more protection of that vital in infrastructure. Next. And so a really great example of doing exactly this um, is what happened out in Hither Creek Dunes. Um, we're going to go into more detail of this project when we go on our field trip, which we'll talk about um, in a few more slides just as we, as we wrap up. Um, but... Um, I'm not going to go into the whole history of this project, but basically for those of you who sort of know, this is where, um, you know, there was um, a salt marsh here, a beautiful salt marsh, and then there was overwash um, up during a storm. And this was um, 2018, right? 2018? Am I? A series of storms that basically brought so much sediment deposit that the salt marsh system was completely are almost completely covered in sand. Um, and so we'll go with, like I said, we'll go into more detail when we're on site. Um, but basically this um, view, this slide is showing the revegetation action. Um, and it was a lot to get to this point um, from a salt marsh turning into a you know heavy layer of sand 
um, and deciding to, instead of trying to remove the sand and recover that salt marsh um, over time, it really was the best decision was to support this dune system. I'm sort of shortening the story and maybe, you know, glossing over some events. But basically with this um, system, this uh, snow fence on the right-hand side um, was a temporary piece of infrastructure that first, you know, started to capture sand. Um, and then many volunteers and Conservation Foundation, Town, Mass Audubon all worked together to begin planting beach grass plugs. And so the plugs alone was really just helping that, you know, kind of helping this that naturally recover. And so these plants are, you know, already part of the system. And rather than waiting for the natural revegetation to occur, um, all these volunteers work together from all these different groups. There's Lamb Bank here. I can see Guthrie um, working together to plant these uh, plugs of beach grass and many other um, species in the area, some shrubby species to kind of help revegetate this to stabilize that dune to protect the um, uh, Millie's Bridge area over in Madiket. And when we, you know, this was done during the heart of COVID, as you can see, everyone was wearing masks. And so it'll be really interesting for those of you who are able to join us for the field trip on Friday to see how this area has changed and recovered um, or not recovered. You know, it'd be kind of interesting to see uh, where we're at with this particular project. And then there's other types of, you know, erosion that we're seeing. Um, I think this is somewhere in Pulpus Harbor, I'm thinking. I can't remember. I think it's somewhere. In, yeah. Um, and so how do we kind of go from this type of erosion and support this type of system? Um, we're, I'm going to kind of gloss through this really quickly because I want to be able to get to the last few slides. Um, but, you know, how do we halt, first of all, halt the erosion in a way, and then how do we use nature-based solutions to help stabilize this bank to remove that or to kind of um, remove the um, erosion action zone or kind of displace it to make a more stabilized bank? Um, and so this was a, uh, if I remember correctly, this is like, you know, something that's done at many, not many, but has been done at some private homes in this area, um, but it's a great example I think of using a combination of nature-based solutions, what we know about um, sand and dune stabilization and revegetation to kind of um, try to stabilize this area. Next. So one of the first things I said is like just to stabilize. And so, you know, with that erosional area that's quite sharp and there's like a scarp where it's there's a targeted action or ener all the erosional energy is going into one spot, you know, there's a gradation um, to, uh, you know, deflect some of the erosion action. Um, of course, this won't work in every system, you know, being along, um, I think it's either, you know, kind of a Monomoy area or Pulpus Harbor, there's less wave action traditionally than if you were on the South Shore, um, but it's first stabilizing the soil. So thinking of this as um, like that four dune system, let's say, where the beach grass was naturally kind of creating that natural woven web of roots. This is a way to do this um, with a nature-based solution that is um, kind of mimicking that, if you will, um, if you want to hit next. And so then it's covering those areas with um, a sand, with sand. Um, and then you can see the beach grass on top of this dune. This is a natural, um, that's natural beach grass, but then we're going to be kind of covering, you know, so covering, the uh, biodegradable material with sediment and then planting that sediment. So if you want to hit next, I think these kind of, the slides got a little mixed up, but that's fine. <laughs> um, the order, so basically this is the schematic of the goals of this type of project, where first we're, you know, putting those coir rolls, that bio biodegradable mesh that is like that physically woven in um, to kind of adhere to the bank. And oftentimes they are like in here, there's either cables or these anchors that kind of anchor them in place so that they stay. So that even if there is wave action, they're kind of more stable. And then they're seeded or sewn in with uh, plant plugs, usually beach grass to start. 
Um, and then because that beach grass go grows really fast, then the beach grass itself adds that woven layer and kind of like kind of weaves it all together. Um, I keep saying weaves it, it's, <laughs> but it's basically growing all together to kind of further stabilize that soil. And then sometimes, depending on the project, they're either follow up with additional plant materials or at the time there's additional plant materials to diversify that. Um, we know that, you know, once again, diverse habitats are more um, stable and we want mixture of shrubs and grasses and forbs to be able to like have a more diverse landscape um, to uh, further reduce wave action and um, and force on that area. If you want to hit next, I can't remember what's next. Yeah, so this is a really, uh, this pic picture is not the, from the same site as the first few. This is a much bigger area. So you can see the people on the far left. This is an area that was kind of completely covered with them. Um, it's not burlap, but I'm. it's like some kind of biodegradable material that's almost like state holding all that material in place. And then it's sort of woven in with, um, um, uh, it's planted through with all the um, beach grass plugs. There you go. Thank you. And then where usually it's watered in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of um, things that happen in the beginning to establish these plants. And then you can see even a relatively steep bank, all of these veg all of this vegetation um, is able to kind of hold this landscape in place. And then we know with more vegetation, there's more sediment trapped and then more um, seeds and plant material that are going to be trapped and then further be established. Next. Yeah, and then this is developed over time um, where there's, and you can see there's other species establishing. I don't know for this particular project if some of those shrubs were placed in there or they're kind of coming in. It could be a mix, um, but, um, and if you want to hit next. Okay, um, just, I'll just end with, um, you know, a lot of those projects that that solution will not work in every area. And so a lot of the nature-based solutions is really knowing where you are, the forces at play in that particular area, um, and then what materials are needed to kind of stabilize that that piece. Thanks, Jen. Of course. Um, and shifting to kind of talking a little bit more about those wetland areas and how they can provide resilience to the upland. This diagram shows, you know, what a less resilient shoreline looks like compared to a more resilient shoreline. And the differences here are really having hard armoring so that the salt marsh doesn't have a migration pathway to move as sea level rise comes up. So as sea level slowly comes up, salt marshes can rise in elevation a little bit, but they can also move backwards. Those plants can actually migrate into the upland as that upland becomes more wet. But if you have a building or an infrastructure piece there, that salt marsh doesn't have a pathway to move. Uh, and you actually get increased erosion as you're hitting those harder, harder surfaces. More resilient areas have intact shorelines where the salt marsh has a place to migrate. Oysters having seagrass beds that make healthier water systems. These are all things that kind of help mitigate the impacts of climate change. So thinking particularly about salt marshes, because we talked about them a lot, that idea that one way we can help be more resilient, one nature-based solution isn't even creating anything, but it's giving salt marshes space to migrate backwards. Um, when there is some kind of structure there, the term we get is called coastal squeeze, which is just a, it's a, it's a great term, but that salt marsh gets squeezed between rising sea level and between a road or um, a building or a seawall. So thinking about how we can facilitate or make our landscape more um, more amenable for salt marshes to migrate is one way we can be more resilient. Another way that we can be more resilient is thinking about how we can protect our shorelines. Um, this is Pulpus Harbor and a Madawi Creek salt marsh that the Conservation Foundation owns. And a few years ago in front of it, we put this oyster reef, which are these long linear lines of oyster castles that oysters grow on. Oysters are great for improving water quality, kind of all those things we saw in the first diagram. One of the things I thought about as Sarah was talking earlier about Brant Point is this looks very much like the breakwater, the structure that was put around Brant Point to protect it. What we are hoping is that we will accumulate sediment here, just like what happened at Brant Point, but instead of getting a beach, we're hoping that our salt marsh will actually grow towards this oyster reef. Um, this is something that 
we haven't necessarily seen happen yet, but that we're researching and hoping will happen so that if our salt marshes don't have space to migrate backwards because there's a road or a building, maybe we can help them migrate into our harbor and gain some more of that salt marsh area, which will help protect um, the upland areas behind it. So that's one adaptation piece that we can think about is how do we gain more salt marsh because it does such a good job of protecting us and mitigating impacts of um, sea level rise. So that's a, a work in progress. Other cities have been thinking similar things. This is a diagram of a coastal resilience plan that was done for the city of Charleston, South Carolina. And the idea is to build out buffers. So you can see behind kind of in the grayer um, coloring here, is uh, the city of Charleston, South Carolina. And there's a main road thoroughfare that goes right along the water here. And there's a really skinny, pretty degraded beach. So part of their um, attempt to make the city more resilient is to raise that main road back here. So that becomes that hard buffer to the city, but also to create a significant increase in elevation where they're creating green buffers between the road and the, the water. It's, it's, it's a river here, but it's a tidal river. Um, and as you approach that river, building um, salt marshes and adaptive wetland areas out into the river itself to provide that buffer. So it's providing a buffer of salt marshes, then a green buffer that could potentially get flooded before you get to the city itself. It's the same idea with what we're potentially hoping to accomplish with the oyster reef, but the oyster reef being a more natural um, letting nature design and create that salt marsh. <clears throat> a couple of years ago when uh, Remain Nantucket's Envision Resilience Project was focused on Nantucket, there were groups of graduate students that were looking at the island and thinking about that same idea. Um, how do we recreate those naturalized, barriers, um, naturalized areas and places on Nantucket? And this was a conceptual design that some of the students from um, the Yale School of Architecture put together. Uh, and this is actually kind of Washington Street extension town area. Maybe this is the town is the town pier right here. Maybe this is Great Harbor um, Yacht Club, just, you know, thinking about your locations in town. Not that this is what those places would do, but this is a conceptualized version of recreating and building out new salt marshes to kind of mimic what probably was likely there in the past to provide buffers to Washington Street and to the areas behind it. And this is kind of a view of it from the other angle looking out into the harbor and is a concept, maybe not the solution for the area, but a concept of how we could adapt some of our, our coastal harbor areas where we know water is coming by bringing some of these more natural areas back in that are able to take the force of storm waves that are able to take rising sea level and be adaptive to those changes coming in. Ooh. And that was my last slide. <laughs> I think it's important too, because you know, because we usually we emphasize nature-based solutions so much, that yes. it's also not an all or nothing. I think that gradation that you showed, Jen, is really important. It depends on the location, what you're protecting or enhancing. Um, mm -hmm. what resources are available, and also the timeline of planning. A lot of the nature-based solutions, if it's purely nature-based, might be buying time versus like that example of protecting vital infrastructure of roadways and things like that. So, um, And I think, it, I was just going to say quickly to build on that, I really appreciate that, Sarah. And one of the ideas with nature-based solutions is that we're using what's here already to enhance our resilience. But like you said, it's it's not gonna protect us forever. It's not, it isn't a seawall, it isn't a hard wall, um, but it has been shown that when you combine things together, you get more resilience. Nature itself is resilient. So building that into solutions is gonna be really important for us in the future. And this idea of coastal resilience and adapting our shorelines is what I like to call kind of a new restoration, adaptation, science. We're learning things every year. So if we can use nature-based solutions to help protect areas for the next 10, 15 years, while we're learning the other lessons and the other adaptations, we might be in a better place in 10, 15 years to design something that could even be more effective at um, preventing the impacts of climate change. I think that's great. And I think if we didn't emphasize it enough between salt marshes and dune systems, 
letting nature take its course is all is great, but it's slow. And so we mm -hmm. cannot keep pace with the rate of climate change, sea level rise, for et cetera. So some of our nature-based solutions are really just like helping things move along at a faster pace in a way. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so as we wrap up, I'm thank you for everyone for sticking around. Um, while we go over the last few things, just wrapping up, if you have questions, there's a few already coming in, but if you have questions, please either put them in the chat or the Q&A, we'll be kind of looking at both. We're gonna read questions out loud so they're part of the recording. Um, we wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we, if you, there's a, as of the beginning of this talk, there were still a few spots left in our Friday um, uh, climate change or coastal ecology walk this Friday at 10 a.m. Um, you can register at ACK <laughs> acclimate summit, um, dot com, um, or at either one of our websites. And, oh, thank you, Jen. Jen just put the, um, website for the climate change summit in the chat. Great. Um, <laughs> um. Oh, yeah, save the date. <laughs> we wanted to, yeah, tell you really <laughs> quick to save the date because our climate change summit is coming back again in September. It's September 4th of this year. That's the information we have so far. And there'll be lots more information as we put that together um, this summer. And just so you know, for those of you who don't know what the climate change summit mm -hmm. is, this is an in-person event on Nantucket at the Great Harbor Yacht Club. Um, they're our generous supporter. And so we have the date. So that's all that's all we have right now, but it's it was a really successful, fun event. So please stay tuned for more. But yes, pencil it in. It'll be the evening, late afternoon of September 4th. All right. Well, we'll have this um slide up while we answer a few questions. Um thank you, Peter, for your nice, kind words. Um one of the comments um, was something that we have talked about in the past that we didn't actually put into this presentation was about groins. So groins um, are perpendicular um, structures that go into the water. And as um, the question is, are what you know what we call groins, the the perpendicular bulwarks extending into the water and blocking the littoral migration of sand, are one approach. Are they effective? And what are the long term effects? on erosion? That's a great question. And actually we we do, when we usually give our coastal ecology class, we do talk a lot about groins and we actually took them out of this presentation because they are actually not currently permitted anymore on in Massachusetts. So you can't decide that you want a groin. However, they are historically grandfathered in. So of course we do have bulkheads and groins around the island of Nantucket. And I think we left one slide in, Jen. Did we leave that one? slide in or you did <laughs> we left it there we like anticipated your question I swear that wasn't like a seated question um but yeah I mean this you know this cartoon diagram has the groin in this case it's, it's rock but most of ours are often actually wood structures that grow right in um, especially on the north shore of the island and you can see like with the the longshore littoral drift as Jen was talking about in this case moving left to right you can see where there's the accretion of sand on one side. So great if you're that house on that one side, that is where the, the littoral drift has stopped. So remember when we slow that water down, the sediment drops out. So that's where that great accretion is. But then what happens on the other side of that groin? You're just displacing that erosional action. And so now there's an erosional deposition on the other side. Um, and so then if you're the poor house on the left, on the right hand side rather, then your neighbor's groin is actually affecting the erosion on your side. And so what do you do? Then you put a groin in and you have accretion on your side and so on and so forth. And so it's the same like wave action and energy is still happening with that littoral drift. You're just dis displacing it or concentrating it in different ways. And so that's one of, I mean, I assume that's one of the reasons that they're not currently um, allowed anymore or permitted. Um, they have a place in some areas, you know, if there's a, you know, they're still used in other parts of the country. And of course we still have them here and they're grandfathered in, um, Jen, I don't know what else you, if you want to add anything to. No, that's, that's a really good question. It does, it solves one person's problem, but creates a problem for someone else. And then 
creates this need to keep extending out that solution. And that's really what we find with all of these more harder or gray infrastructure solutions to erosion is that it can be really effective in one place, but it puts then that erosional impact somewhere else. Somebody else is going to feel that erosional impact, um, whether it's your next door neighbor or you know farther down and you either then need to end up, say if you take the example of Nantucket, maybe circling the island with groin so that no one's feeling that erosion or a seawall and that comes to you know what kind of beach is it that you would like to to live on um, and that is then when we circle back to this idea of nature-based solutions and using nature to be more resilient as opposed to pushing impacts off on somebody else it's a great question <clears throat> um another question jen was um can you talk a little bit about the impacts of our drinking water on Nantucket, oh. especially, you know, I'm assuming this came from the sea level rise piece mm -hmm. and impacts to fresh water. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And I think, you know, I, since I moved out here to the island, which has now been what, 16, 17 years, always heard stories about how, you know, groundwater wells in Mattaquet would occasionally get salty. You know, if you're, if you had your well, you would occasionally get salty water um, because out there that, that lens between the salty groundwater and the amount of fresh water we have out there is, is pretty thin. So it's, you, ground, you know, salt water intrusion, they call it getting salt water move up into those areas where your freshwater wells are. Um, so that's happened to some degree on the island. Uh, it, it, that will be enhanced for places that are on well water where that interaction between the salty groundwater and the fresh groundwater um, becomes closer to the surface, we're going to start seeing saltwater intrusion in more places. What we most likely won't see is intrusion into our aquifer. Our aquifer is this larger collection of groundwater that's in the center of the island that um, is fairly well protected and we most likely in any of our lifetimes or our great grandchildren's lifetimes see intrusion of that saltwater into the aquifer. Um, that's the most likely case scenario. We don't expect it, but then again, I wouldn't say we know everything there is to know about groundwater on the island and what's going to happen with sea level rise. Anything to add to that, Sarah? <laughs> no, I think that was, you know, you said it very well. I think, um, you know, I think whenever we've given talks, um, people, like, especially when we're giving live talks, people come to us after I feel like I've heard a few um, saltwater intrusion of wells, like especially in the Madiket area. Um, so in certain areas where the maybe historic homes or and the wells were kind of grandfathered in where they're already close to areas, um, there there's already some of that. But I think, you know, with the aquifer um, as deep as it is, I think that um, I would completely agree with what Jen said. Um, yeah. Great. How far below the surface is the aquifer? See, I knew that <laughs> I don't I know the answer to that question. And I know, I know that the primary aquifer, like the glacially deposited aquifer, um, like the water that it was actually deposited thousands of years ago by the glaciers is quite far down there. Um, and then the water that we pull right now for our drinking water is actually a uh, a little bit more of a shallow groundwater lens that's mm -hmm. uh, recharged through rainwater, but I don't have exact depths for you. That's something we would, I yeah. would have to look up. I don't know it off the top of my head. That's a good question though. I feel like, uh, like we'll prepare we need to add, we'll add that to our lecture. That's a good one for us yeah. to make sure we have the numbers on and, and research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've been told, I've read that and I've been told it, but I don't have it on the, up the top of yeah. my head for you tonight. I'm very sorry. Same. Um. I think that's all the questions we have. We had some, you know, pleasant comments in the chat. So thank you everyone. Once again, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we really enjoy sharing this information and really want to keep the dialogue going. We want to hear what people are seeing and the impacts people are feeling. Um, and so we hope to see you on Friday and where we're going to have a walk and talk and learn. Um, and otherwise, feel free to contact us if you have any questions or any climate change impacts you want to share. Anything else, also, Jen? If there are any other to lecture topics, things you want us to explore, kind of breaking stuff out into individual lecture topics like we did this winter is a little bit new for how we've 
done our communication. Um, so if there are topics relevant to Nantucket that you think would be great, send one of us an email um, and we'll add it to our consideration and planning for next winter. Yeah, we'd love to hear what people want to know about, what your what kind of presentations work for you, how do people learn, what yeah. do you want to know? So Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you.